His 13 shopkeepers, including their names, their shop names, key wares, some of their personality traits, and quest lines that you can follow for your D&D games. Including one that I'm going to leave right for the end that will be unlike anything you've ever used in your D&D games before. Urgund the Tuskless is the proprietor of the Toothless Uruk, a small tavern in a mountainside village. There are few regulars and locals, mainly servicing adventurers that are passing through the town, and his special brew is the Iceborne Ale, a hoppy ale made from hardy northern hops and brewed beneath the Iceborne lakes around the mountainside village. While on his exterior, he's a welcoming figure with a love of strong ales and a log burnt fire, he holds a dark secret. He's an exile from a nomadic tribe of orcs, and the thing that he did to be exiled from the tribe and have his tusks shorn down to nothing is completely up to you. Baba Bethild is an elderly, gummy crone with a timeless headscarf and a rasp on every one of her words. From her deerskin tent, she sells all sorts of potions and salves, ingredients and components for spells, and offers healing services to those who are less fortunate. Beneath her headscarf is a sea of snakes, a sign of the great coven of hags that she once belonged to. That is, until she found greater purpose in healing those that are less fortunate than her, and getting that sense of community from finding a better use for her witchcraft than the one that she was already using it for. In addition to her services, she can also pay the party in exchange for finding rare ingredients that she's looking for. Recently, she found an eye carved into one of the wooden beams that supports her tent, a full warning that her old coven is aware of her whereabouts now, and that she should watch every single shadow. Petronia Drakenshield is a golden dragonborn with a stucky frame, she uses her breath weapon to forge incredible items of immense power and value, made from draconian steel and dragon glass. She's a young smith, a prodigy from an unknown trainer, but she's making her mark in a city where dragonborn are incredibly rare, and so is the talent that she shows. Her bespoke items are becoming renowned across the land for their sharp edge, perfect balance and ornate designs, but such fame doesn't come without its prices, and the noble family that she abandoned to follow her passion and dreams may just have found where their daughter has gone. Berthold Beefcake and Tiny Tim run a general store. It's called The Best Fiends and Fine Wares, and it's run by the quick-witted closet named Berthold and his best friend, the dim-witted troll named Tim. Walking up to the second story where the entranceway is, you have to traverse thin walkways above the store as Tim walks around underneath finding the items that you're looking to purchase before handing them up to Bertolt who can then sell them to you. They have a true love-hate relationship as Bertolt abandoned his fiendish armies to save Tiny Tim but they still argue like an old married couple. In addition to all of their services and general wares, Bertolt can serve as a sort of go-between for completing jobs of a more infernal nature. High up in the trees of a forest just outside of town is a haphazard treehouse. On all of the branches that creep their way in through the cracks in the walls of the treehouse are uh, little bits of glimmering golden jewellery and occasionally armour. The shopkeeper, Glitter, is a Kenku that only speaks in parroted phrases that they've heard throughout their times as shopkeeper and some of their previous travels. They collect jewellery and armour infuse it with some sort of arcane potential, enchantments and magic, learnt from a book of enchantments that they found, before selling it on to their customers. In a shop called All That Glitters Is Gold, I wonder who might come for that enchanted book, or some of the jewellery that has gone missing throughout the town. Torag is a hefty lizard folk, who always wears a filthy apron and carries an enormous meat cleaver. He has never been seen without his lopsided chef's hat on either. Every day at 8pm he serves up his magic potluck at the local tavern, the Lucky Beholder. Being a lizard folk, people sometimes assume that there could be flesh of a more humanoid nature in some of his potlucks. But Korag promises that that's only happened maybe once or twice. Max. Either way, the food is delicious and has a range of buffs and benefits to the people who eat it. And they last until the very next to long rest, not the one of that night. Although, on the off chance that you roll a one, you might be feeling a little bit disadvantaged. It might also be possible to get some extra special buffs from the potluck if you bring some rare ingredients that uh, Korag is looking for. 
or if you shut up some pesky townsfolk that have been spreading nonsense rumours about missing pets or beloved animals. Kalak is a regal Arakokra with a passion for flight, feathers, and fast delivery. He prides himself on his motto of having the fastest delivery in the Swords Coast, and employs a team of various birds to deliver his packages and mail far and wide. Other than his airmail office in the main city, you'll most often see Kalak soaring overhead with his mailbag, before occasionally sweeping down to drop off a package or a letter. If you need a message of any sort sent, or a package sent as fast as possible for a fair price, or even a part-time delivery job, Kalak is the person to go to. Just don't suggest any arcane methods of delivery, otherwise he might ruffle his feathers. Faye's Floral Fancies is a blink and you'll miss it sort of store. A fairy door nestled into a tree stump in a glorious flower bed. Knock, gently, and Faye will make herself known. A golden pixie so slight that you could mistake her for a floating leaf or a snowflake gently drifting in the air. Just don't mention that to her. From her flower bed and stump, she sells all sorts of potions, ingredients, and components for magic spells, as well as magically infused bouquets of flowers. These can be used to conjure all sorts of magical effects. You need only ask her to find out what she can do for you. Recently, however, a group of vandals have sought to destroy her flower bed, and she'd definitely reward the person who found and brought the culprits to justice. Stooping through a tiny entrance in a midnight blue tent, you find yourself in an impossibly large space. A swirling visage of a galaxy spreads across the interior of the tent. And right in the centre you see a swirling orb of bright white light, a burning stick of incense, and two pillows either side of the orb. A flurry of tarot cards flies through the air, shortly followed after by a Githyanki woman by the name of Trezel. Dreads of white hair cascade down her head, framing her almost paper white eyes, and the spider-like tattoos that she has spreading all over her face. Through her pursed lips, she tells the fortunes of those who can pay. Although the price for such information is not one that can be paid for with mere coin, no. Trezel asks for favours that match the information that she grants, for destiny dictates it. The price might be anything, a like, a subscribe, if they're enjoying the video, I mean reading, or a comment of their favourite idea so far. Who knows? Docked at port is the barnacle-covered pirate ship of the Captain Ocreon, an all-back Sahuagin, limping upon her peg leg and donning a tri-point cap alongside her trident spear. She left behind a life of servitude beneath the surface, in exchange for one roaming free across the wide open seas. She's brash, a lover of coin and a good fight, and an adventurer at heart. While she often employs less legal means of earning her coin. The city allows for her business as she pays fair taxes and bribes, keeps her illicit dealings outside of the city, and actually deals with some of the lesser criminals that the city just don't want to bother with. She offers passage across the treacherous seas for a fee, but be prepared to be involved in some sketchy business if you take her charter. In Z's is a red tiefling inked from head to toe in tattoos of all sorts of designs and colour. He holds his entirely black eyes incredibly kindly, and when he casts spells, the related ink glows and moves, an animated display of the effects of the spell being cast across his skin. His studio is filled with artwork, some his, others bought from his inspirations, and he takes great pride in his work. While his art itself is incredible on its own, the effects that it can produce are wondrous. Spells and enchantments on the very skin of the caster, ready to be drawn upon at a moment's notice. The budding wizard will find it hard to forget their spell book with them etched into their skin. Just be cautious when you see that storm giant, nearly covered in ink of Inzi's design. Who doesn't want to nestle up with an ancient text, reading about and foretelling the ancient plague that is bound to come up in the next hundred years? No? Well, sometimes finding just the right scripture is exactly what an adventurer needs to solve a case or a mystery. Sometimes of the cataclysmic nature. Thankfully for you adventurers, Ventsner is a Marilith who has dropped her swords in exchange for becoming the most efficient librarian ever. She still holds her venomous tongue, 
but instead she uses it to shush inane chit-chat in her library, and her keen mind has been put to collecting texts of immense value and historical import. You need only prove your good faith for use of her library, as well as paying or doing some sort of favour, to use it, and I'm sure you'll find some texts that are of a special value. Every now and then, on a particularly dark and moonless night, perceptive adventurers might hear scratching or clawing just from where their bag of holding was before seeing the lithe, emaciated figure of the bagman clawing its way out of their bag. Hopefully he was already under your employ. If not, he can be bought for the right price. You can pay him handsomely to attain rather rare and valuable items from across the extraplanar space, finding his way into other bags of holding to collect things that would otherwise be one of a kind or impossible. The longer he has to look for an item, the heftier the price. Time is money after all, and you do not want to be in debt to the bagman. Perhaps to wipe your debts clean, you could find the poor sap who thought he could rip off the bagman and throw his bag of holding away, cast it aside, lost and forgotten. But the bagman always collects his debts. Having a selection of shopkeepers to fill your campaign setting is one thing, but being a DM is all about learning from every single session. Curse of Strahd is a campaign that I learned so much from, and I wouldn't be anywhere near as good of a DM without it. So watch this video to find out the things that I learned from Curse of Strahd in over 200 hours of gameplay.